So we'll start in a little while or um I think you can go ahead. Okay, great. So so for today I'll just uh recap some some of what we did last time. So last time I've covered 2.1 up to 2.3. Um, again, the idea is you want to solve systems of linear equations, systems of linear equations, and there are some numerical issues that arise from them. Uh, and there's a, some motivation from section 2.1. The theory is relatively easy, but the numerical aspects are a bit more complicated. Uh, the idea is that no one solves a system of linear equations this way, at least in the numerical in the numerical settings. No, no, no one literally computes the inverse. So typically, the idea is to introduce what is called an LU factorization of A. So last time, I merely talked about the fact that there is such a factorization, but we didn't go into the details about what this factorization would look like. Uh, but um, on a, on a, um, from a big picture point of view, the L here is set to be a unit lower triangular matrix, and then U is an upper triangular matrix. And the idea is to split it, split A, or to decompose A into these, into this kind of product, so that it becomes very easy to solve a system of linear equations. Uh, there was an exercise uh, where the upper triangular matrix was the one that it was that was unit upper triangle triangular matrix. What that means is that the diagonal uh, has ones okay, instead of the L. That, those are sort of like normalizations uh, to make sure that the number of unknown entries in A uh, match the number of unknown entries on the right. So that's the sort of like the idea. Otherwise, there would be more unknowns on the right side, right-hand side of this uh, equation here. And then and compared to the one on the left side. So there was some, uh, I included some remarks about how to weave Julia in R Markdown in Quarto. Uh, and then we went through some basic Julia stuff, how to set up these um, vectors and matrices, uh, how to do plots. And then some of the nice things that you see from plots, like making a LaTeX version of uh, of the axes, um, and then this option setting game. Okay. Afterwards, we also did some demonstration of the numerical issues. So 2.3.7 shows some of the subtractive cancellation issues uh, that you may encounter. And uh, this is basically what happened here, that you have lots of accuracy for the beta here, but then you lose a lot of accuracy when you want to solve for x, okay? And then you have some strange syntax here about diag m, which is specific to FNC actually. And then you have these pair objects that are relatively new. Okay, uh, I don't think it's used any in any other way in the chapter anymore, aside from this part, okay? Uh, definitely you could literally put in all of these entries according to the address if you, if you wanted to, okay? And then another thing is that there's sort of like this push command where you could put it into a, you could put, you could sort of like concatenate these results into one vector uh like a loop so when you get a result you sort of like append it to an existing vector and then if you go on through the loop you also you append the next set of results and so on without overriding the others uh and then there's a pretty table this pretty table is again part of fnc i didn't put fnc dot anymore here but it's part of fnc and uh there has to be a way to do this more natively without uh, referring to FNC, but I didn't explore that. Uh, but that, that might be something good to do. Uh, and then we went into the details about F, about Backsub, the algorithm behind it and how it was set up. And then we did some exercises where we, uh, how should I put it? Ah where the idea is to write functions, 
Okay, simple functions. So how do you how do you create an LU factorization where you want U to be unit triangular, unit upper triangular instead? And then we have another version where you have the determinant, write a determinant function where you don't actually literally code the definition of the determinant, but you use the LU factorization to have, and then exploit the determinant properties to calculate the determinant of some matrix A. Okay. I think I stopped there. Okay. I think now, that's pretty cool that you can uh, use that same factorization to do two, like two very useful things, solve equations and also calculate the determinant, which are related. Don't get me wrong, but it's pretty cool. Yeah. So the so it's quite it's quite nice having these con conveniences really really does help and you really don't need to even know the determinant of a by definition you just need to know a couple of these properties and exploit some of the structure from the LU fact from an LU factorization it should be fine okay um the next part that we that that, that I'm gonna do today is LU fact. Okay, to look into this factorization more explicitly. So last time I've used it and taken it as given. This time uh, we're gonna go into some of the detail. The idea is that uh, you want this a a you want to decompose a into l times u, and um, l has a normalization where the main diagonal contains ones, uh, and the idea the 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 question is how do you actually fill up the entries of L and the entries of U. The upper upper part, the, the one above the main diagonal for L, you already know to be zero. You also know that the main diagonal has ones, but the remaining part, we don't know. For U, we actually don't know the main diagonal and the one that is above the main diagonal, but below, below the diagonal, we know it's all zeros. So how do you fill up all the remaining entries of L and U? So the idea is to exploit the fact that matrix multiplication could be thought of as a sum of outer products. So that's the that's the key. And uh, typically, when you're introduced to matrix multiplication, it's done on a per entry basis. So we want to know for every entry, how do I get this entry? So we take a row and take it an inner product with the with the with a column. Here we do it in a different way. So this is very, very nice. And this is a typical feature in the chapter, like rewriting something uh, that we are used to in by hand into something that is more useful when we do it uh, using a computer. So the idea is that I could write A as a sum of outer products of this form. So this L and this U are L here is the columns are the columns of L and then U sub K are the columns of U, but because there's a transpose, it becomes um, it becomes a row. Okay, so U transpose K are the rows of U. So here, as you notice, it's column times row and then add them all up at the end. Okay, and you get all the entries of L times U directly rather than the other way, which is, for matrix multiplication, the usual way is for every entry, you take uh, the inner product of the row and the column, and then you do it for every entry, okay? So that's the difference, okay? So visually, this is what it looks like. So this is the notation that is used in the book. Uh, a bold-faced uh, A, small a, from a matrix capital A uh, is a column, okay? And then if you put the transpose in it, it's actually a, a row, okay? So this A matrix here is decomposed into L times U. And again, L sub one up to L sub N are the columns of L, and then U one transpose until U N transpose are the rows of U. Now, the, the nice thing is that the triangularity of the matrices contain a structure, and that means that these L's and U's have zeros in them. And the idea is to find what L and U would look like given what we know what A would look like. So you know the entries of A, but you don't know the entries L and U. So there are two things that we need to be able to do this factorization. One is to, one is to exploit the fact that you have this outer product representation, okay? So that's what you see here. 
Okay. This is L sub one U one transpose plus until L sub N U sub N transpose. But the more interesting thing is that suppose for the sake of argument, I already know what's L sub one and U sub one transpose. Okay. If I know them, I could write A minus L sub one U one transpose in terms of, again, an, a, a sum of outer products. Okay. That's the sort of like the idea. And one thing that is very nice about this uh, expression here is that L sub two, U sub two transpose has zeros on their first entries already. Okay. They have zeros in their first entries already. And for the others, you have zeros, let's say for L sub three, it's zeros in the first two entries. And then U sub T has zeros on the first two entries as well. So that means that their contribution, the successive contribution of all of these outer products are on the remaining parts of the matrix. So roughly it's something like, so this part sort of like takes care of So you have all of these entries in the matrix that will be L1, U1 transpose. And then you add the next one, L2, U2 transpose, where you know right away that all of these are zeros. And then what this fills up is the remaining part. And then for the next chunk, you have zeros for the first two rows and then first uh, two columns, and then you fill the remaining part of the matrix using L3, U3 tra transpose, and so on. So essentially, um, essentially the idea is that uh, you basically repeat this kind of process where after you know L1, U transpose, U1 transpose, you go through the calculation once more as if this was the new A matrix. And then once you figure out what L2, U2 transpose looks like, you take it out. And then what's left is again, a uh, matrix, uh, 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 a sum of uh, outer products, and it has a particular structure again, and that will be your new matrix. And then you apply the algorithm there again. So that's what it kind of looks like. And the other component of the calculation is that if you look at the first row, first column, of the matrix with known entries, meaning A, okay? If you look at them, okay, you could write it in this form. So this E1 transpose is basically pick out the first entry, okay? First, uh, yeah. So you have this matrix A, okay? So this is, sorry. Yeah, so this is your matrix A, A equals LU. And then if you put an E1 transpose, uh, what it does is do something like one, it puts a one in the place where you want to pick out uh, the first row, okay? So when you do this, this will be, when you go through the multiplication, what this does is it picks out uh, the first row of A and Pick out the first row of A, and knowing that A has this outer product uh, representation, you could write it down in this way okay? after some work. Okay? And the idea is that the fact that E1 T transpose and then these L sub Ks have zeros in them. Okay? And because you know have zeros in them, this a sub one could be written as L sub one, one U one transpose. What this means is that the first row of A is actually the first row of U one transpose times L sub one, one, which is the first row, first column entry of L. But you know this to be one from the fact that you have a unit lower triangular matrix. Therefore, A sub one is actually U one transpose. And it's easier to look at it from right to left. This part is something that we we don't know. The right side is something that we don't know. A sub one is something that we do know. So if you read it the other way around, that tells you that U sub one transpose is actually A sub one divided by L one one. And L one one is known to be one. Therefore, A sub one has to be U one T. And similarly, 
you could go through the same calculation from the point of view of the first column of A. And the first column of A is actually U sub one, one times L sub one, okay? Okay, so that means that, uh, yeah. So once you know, once you know what L sub one looks like, you could solve for A sub one transpose divided by U one, one, okay? So that's sort of like the idea, okay? And the pseudocode kind of looks like this, okay? You initialize L and U, make a copy of A, call it A sub one, okay? And then U sub one T, okay? U sub one T is the first row of A1 as from here, okay? And then L sub one is the first column of A1 divided by U sub one one. And U sub one one, you know, U sub one one was already gotten from, was already obtained from uh, the previous step because you figured out what's the first row of, uh, of U. So you know the first row, first, first column entry, and then you know L1. And then you take out this L1, U1 transpose. You take this out, and then you have a, a new matrix, you call it A sub two. And then you repeat steps three to five as if A2 were A1. Because the key thing is that when you subtract out the L1, U1, there's yes. zeros there, right? Th that's right. Okay. So once you take that out, you act as if A2 was the starting point, okay? Uh, that's sort of like the, sort of like the idea. And uh, and after, and let me just show you the code. The pseudo code kind of looks like this, yeah? So let me make this a bit bigger, yeah? So you so as you can see from the function, you initialize the size of the, you, you find out what's the size of the matrix, you have a storage space for L, a storage space for U, uh, make a copy of A1. At, I'll talk about that in a moment. So make a copy of A, and I'm going to call it A sub 1, okay? And then this is sort of like the first step, okay? Step 3. And this part is uh, step 4, okay? And this is like an LU transpose, okay? okay? And then you have minus equals here. So that means that you take out... Okay. Uh, in the next step, you take out the what what you what you got from here, okay, and then put it into the, a new matrix in the next matrix, and then end uh, with the last uh, with the last entries. So sort of like that's the uh, that's the underlying idea. Okay. Yeah. Okay, and then give me back the lower triangular matrix and the upper triangular matrix. And that's roughly what it looks like, okay? So the, the new thing about uh, LUFAC is that you have this uh, command here, okay? And you also have syntax for selecting the kth row and the kth column from a matrix. And you have this uh, decrements. No? So uh, that's sort of like the new, the new things here. Uh, there was a reason mentioned about why there was a, uh, there was a copy for a um i'm i'm not sure i understood it very well but the this one is the explanation for that part but i this is beyond me for for the for the for the moment uh yeah well, i think and it's just it, because yeah. you're having to you're subtracting in place right so you're mm -hmm. going to just you'll destroy a when you do that so yeah you, yeah so yeah you're right. You're right. Yeah. So that you, you have a you starting. You want to keep the original matrix. Yeah. 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 That's right. Thanks. And then the other issue that the book talks about is the fact that um, it's not going to be very un very likely. It's not going to be very likely that your LU would have integer entries, even with even if A has integer entries. So that's why you have a float here to make sure that things would work out. Otherwise, you'll have problems here in the division part, okay? Yeah, so, when I was playing around with some of the assignments, I ran into issues with that. Like, you have to remember that Julia, because it's like kind of just in time compiled, that it, it's very strict about types. So you can't just willy nilly, like you can an R, right? You can just be very yeah, sloppy. About that's types. right. It's kind of similar to what I've done here. 
So if you, yeah, if, you yeah. that, if you did this without this dot here, this will fail. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I think that's the that's the part about two point four. Uh, if there are questions, uh, remarks, yeah. Yeah, the remaining part of section 2.4 is really just solving this system of linear equations, but it mentions that it's unstable. That's that's about it, okay. Uh, and then the remaining part, 2.5, is really sort of like doing a, a measure of computational time. Uh, and there's a sort of like a definition of what flop means. Uh, every scalar addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, and square root counts as one flop. Uh, okay, and then the idea is that you want to count the total number of flops, but focus on the the dominant component of the total flops. The idea is that uh the dominant component of the total flops is typically a function of what they call a problem size. Okay, in this context, the problem size is really the dimension of the matrix A. Okay, how many rows and how many columns do you have? Okay, so the idea is, uh, is illustrated by this example that you see here. The idea is that, let's say, if you want to sum the integers from one up to n, it's really n times n plus one divided by two. So as you may have noticed, this is really, both of these sides are functions of n. Okay, so the number of integers that you have that you want to add together. So in that sense, that's the problem size. And then uh, the dominant component of this summation is really the fact that this is n squared divided by two plus n divided by two. So n squared is actually the one that will increase much more if n increases. So that's the dominant component of this sum, okay? And, we, and it would dominate uh, this one because this one grows faster than n. So this section is all about this kind of type calculations, okay? So as, you, as you've seen earlier, there are functions of n. So function of n here, function of n here, or here, if you wish. Okay. And then n is the problem size, and you have the new notation, big O, okay? So f of n is big O of g of n whenever f divided by g is bounded above as n goes to infinity, okay? And that's one definition that was in the book. Another definition is this tilde, uh, which is saying that f is asymptotic to g. And this happens when f divided by g goes to one as n goes very large. So earlier, we know that this thing is n squared plus n divided by two. And the dominant component is really n square. So intuitively, the idea is that if I look at n square as another function of n, okay, both these two sides, okay, are growing at the same rate, roughly speaking. Uh, another way to think about that is n square plus n divided by two divided by n square is actually bounded. So if you do the, the, the algebra, this is one plus n, oh, sorry, one plus one over, sorry, one half plus one over two n, that's embarrassing. So that's one half plus one over two n, there. And as n grows large, okay, as n grows large, uh, this one is actually going to zero, okay? And this one stays there. So that's the idea. Let me see, there's a chat. Ah, don't worry. Uh, there's also a cat here that threw something. So I, ha I have to attend to that later. <laughs> um, the next uh, concept is this tilde. This one, you want to make sure that it goes to one as n goes to infinity. So if you let, go, let n go to infinity here, this goes to one half. So if you want that to go to one, you have to divide by one half. Okay, so that's why it's n squared over two here. Okay. And the section also does all of these calculations. I won't go through all of them, but it's really literally counting uh, every operation. Uh, the simplest one to do is the inner product. And I, I suggest that you try it for, for yourself too. Basically you have 
all of these calculations involve functions of n again, the size of the square matrix. And as you may have noticed, uh, for matrix multiplication, it's actually n cubed. And for triangular systems, it's n square and so on. And there's a discussion where for general systems of equations, they derived that uh, you have two n, it's asymptotic to n, two n cubed divided by three flops, okay? Okay. But what you should notice here is that these are polynomial functions of n. So, or if you wish, uh, powers of n. Okay. So all of them have this kind of form where the running times, which we'll call t, behaves like O, big O, n to the p. Another way to think about that is that t divided by n sub p, sorry, is equal to c, if you wish. Okay, so so this is sort of like bounded, uh, bounded above. So you have some constant c, and t grows at a rate relative to n so n to the p, roughly in a stable way. So something like that. So, and the c is typically unspecified or problem specific. If if you could derive it, okay. So for example, for the inner product, uh, this is two. For general systems of linear equations, you have two over three or something like that. Okay. Uh, and then there's a calculation that was uh, available in the book where you want to calculate computational time. Now, this part here, this part here is from the book. This part is, uh, a curiosity from my end. So I just put this part, and this is not in the book, okay? So let me focus on the part that is in the book, okay? So here you have sort of like a, a, a sequence, okay? From 400 to 4,000, and then you have this uh, step size, okay? And the idea is that you want uh, the problem size to grow large, okay? With the same e increments. And then the idea is you want to calculate the LU factorization okay, of A. And this A matrix is actually, uh, if I'm not mistaken, this is the normal random nor uh, sorry, random numbers from a normal distribution uh, and then put it inside a matrix A of n by of size n by n. Okay. I think the entries are independent of each other. Okay. Uh, so that's the matrix that they look into. And then they calculate this LU factorization, okay? Now, how do you cal calculate the elapsed time? That's this part. So time is equal to at elapsed. But the strange part here is this four part, okay? So typically, if you want to just time an LU factorization, you'll just focus on LU of A. But here, what they do is put a loop. Uh, this may feel strange, but the, the, the idea for this is that if I don't have this, then I have to divide, I think you have to divide all of these by 12. So the it becomes, the, these, these numbers might become very small because LU of A is fast, okay? So they sort of like magnified it a bit, okay? But feel free to change, the, there's nothing special I think about this number 12. So you could feel free to make this large if you if you wish, okay? But yeah, that's sort of like the idea. And again, you see this push, where you have an empty vector here, and then you, for every time you go through a problem of size 400, there would be a, t, a time, put it into the t vector, do 800, append it to the, to the vector t, and so on. And then you have a collection of uh, computational times for each n. And then you have a pretty table that you can see here, okay? So that's the so th those are the book specific code and the strange thing about it. Uh, what I did here was to ensure that I have the same random seed for reproducibility. I tried it, and you could try it, and you might not get the same thing, which I don't know why. So I this is a mystery for me at the moment. Okay. What do you mean you get a different thing when you yes, write it even you get different dif different computational times. But I'm not sure if oh. they, I'm not sure if they have the same A matrix. That I haven't checked. Yeah, that the timing will vary probably because of what's going on with your computer. Um, yeah, 
So, but but that, I don't know if if it should be affected by it if they're using the same sort of like streams. But I, I don't know. Yeah. So maybe this is a non-issue, but yeah, uh, that's something that was weird. I mm. thought. And another thing is this part that is specific to the code, which is this part, which is throw away to force compilation. So uh, this is also, I think the idea is that you want to calculate how long it takes to do the LU factorization without dealing with the fact that Julia does this compilation. Okay, So it's sort of like, okay, you compile this LU, this rand in, but I'm not sure what sort of faction, what, I guess you have to go through all the functions here to to force compilation, but I'm not very sure. So that's sort of like the idea here, but you repeat the same thing. One thing to notice is that intuitively, we should see that the entries in this column would be a bit larger than this one because you did it, we didn't throw away to force compilation in the previous code, okay? But actually, I'm not sure why, but for example, here I have 5.57, here it's 8.4 for this part. So I'm not sure what's happening there. Well, it's only the first one, right? So it only changed the time for 400. Uh, and 800, actually, it's lower for 800. One, two is also lower, okay? Yeah, but I mean, the compilation, I think only affects the first Oh, time. really? Ah, okay. So the other ones are probably just subject to random variability on random your variability. machine. Yeah. <laughs> huh. So I don't know if every loop you have to for throw away to force compilation every time. That's also something that uh, No, uh, once it compiles the rant, once it compiles the uh the LU function, right? I I think if you change twelve to something bigger, you won't see as much mm. changing. Huh. Okay. So I that that's sort of like the weird part. I I, I yeah. I yeah, it is a bit weird. Yeah. And then I also share with you sort of like calculations, a calculation in R, uh, because you have T is equal to C N to the P if you take logs, and this is what the book does. You get something that looks like this. Okay. So if you take logarithms of time and the problem size, and if you if you look at the pattern of times and the problem size on a scatter plot, you should see roughly a line, okay, with slope equal to p. Okay, so for LU, it's two thirds n, uh, well, two thirds n cube, or if you wish, uh, n cube. Okay, so you should see some. It's o n cube. Okay, it's o n cube. So. Uh, you should see something like a p is equal to three, and that would be the slope of log n. So I did a, a small regret least squares. Okay, these are the data points. Okay, run least squares, and I get something like a slope near, well, not really near three. If you look at the standard error, but well, you have to look. If you look at a plot, you'll see it's kind of two it's times kind of asymptote, asymptote to it, right? For a small uh, n, it's not going to be. Yeah, for it's sure. Not a straight line, right? Yeah, so you could see it in the plots too. So if you I leave think. out some of the early points, then maybe it'll be better fit. Huh? Yeah, so it oh. kind of looks something like, yeah. let me, yeah, you here, go. Yeah. you see? It doesn't work very well here. So maybe if I push this even further, it should be okay. And then start at some big end. <laughs> yeah, but uh, the idea is that you sort of like use Julia Eval. This is from uh, Julia Call. And then do well, a, yeah. Sorry. Th that plot was in log base ten, but this is log natural log. Ah, yeah, this is log uh base e, right? Base e. You're right. But that should affect the constant term. Yeah, that won't matter. Right? Yeah. That should affect the constant term, but not as slow, as far as I that's correct. Yeah. 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 So yeah. So that's so an experiment to do is to push n a bit, like n four thousand colon four hundred colon twenty thousand or something like that, and then yeah, and then wish for the best, yeah, <laughs> yeah something like that. Uh, there are some 
I didn't go through the scatter plot here, but you could see sort of like L, capital L showing up again. You could see this option part showing up again. And here is the nice thing. You could put it on the logarithmic scale directly without having to do the transformation. That's one thing to notice. The, the plot here, this might feel strange to you, but this is, this is really calculating T equals C N to the P. But the problem is that I don't know what C is. So what they do is sort of like, okay, I know that the ending time is equal to C, a, a universal constant times the ending problem, problem size raised to the P. And then you also have the, the original equation that looks like this. And then if you divide both sides, then you remove C. So that's a way to sort of like plot that line without having to worry about C. That's the idea if you if you're if you're wondering what this where this comes from. Okay. And that should give you that line there. And I think I'm done. So the these are the things to notice. And then the other thing to notice is that it's using LU rather than LU fact. That's one thing to note. But they didn't go through what LU looks like. And then these are the eccentricities that I just noted. Okay, so I think I've I'm over the time. So uh, I, if you have questions, do let me know. Yeah. No worries. I didn't. I read, <laughs> made some notes on the next two sections, but I don't have a lot. So. Okay, great. Sorry. Um. That. No worries. It was a busy week. Um, so yeah, I went ahead on the next two sections. Let me just share the desktop. So, um, okay. The next section in the book talks about let me actually, these are Andrew's notes. When we do this LU factorization um, in the algorithm, where is it? I know it's here. So we see we have these divisions. Um, and depending on your matrix A, these might be zero. Okay. And so the next section talks about row pivoting, which is a, a trick sort of you can rearrange the rows of A. And if you keep that index order, you can say, like get the solution. Um, so essentially we can swap rows of A so that we can avoid division by zero. Um, and the where we switch we call that a pivot element so this is just saying that this is the um position and you that we're switching and it said yeah so we just pit swap I, I think swapping sounds more natural than pivoting but we just swap the rows of a um so that when we're doing that knockout method that andrew just talked about if we choose the index of the row that has the largest element absolute value and then we of A. And then we move that to that position. So if we're doing the one one that we talked about earlier, um, you would look in all of the columns and or yeah, all of the columns, whichever one has the absolute value, that becomes a new row one. Then you keep going down. Um, as Andrew had those nice pictures where we saw everything kind of gets deleted and then you're just swapping um, in subsets. And then they introduce this theorem that says, you know, this works as long as your original matrix is non-singular, which, you know. Um, so then they just say, when you add this, step of permutation now we're going to call it permutation LU factorization um it's nothing that special but 
essentially, right? You just keep track of the order that you permuted. You also permute B, the elements of B in the same order, and then you can solve the uh, system of linear equations. And uh, this LU function, which I think is the same one that Andrew was just using, does this PLU. Um, and as we mentioned, and I think Ron mentioned this, right? If you just store the LU factorization instead of using the LU to solve all the way, if you just store the factorization, you can use that LNU matrix to solve multiple things. Like we saw the determinant. If we change B, we can solve for many different Bs. Um, and yeah, the choice is just the largest magnitude. And they go through um, a little exercise about condition numbers saying, you know, why we choose the largest one. And it's essentially because of the condition number of the problem. I didn't add an exercise in here, but I can just go through these no notes. The next section was on norms. Uh, so we go through vector norms. The norm just means how do we measure the size of this um, object that's not a scalar. Uh, there's multiple measures that you can use. There's the L2 norm, the max norm, or L infinity norm, and uh, another max norm. The A norm, you can construct your own norm. They have to follow certain um, rules. They have to be a positive scalar function um, and obey this triangle inequality that just says the sum of two norms is greater than or equal to the norm of the sum of two vectors. Um, those E vectors that we saw before are an example of unit vectors. That just means that the norm of the vector is one. Most of the time we only deal with the two norm, which is like the sum of the, uh, we can look at the formula, but <laughs> it's like the sum of the squares that square rooted. Um, and then we can express our any vector in this magnitude direction form. So this is our vector. Um, this kind of gives us the direction and then these are the magnitudes. Okay. When we deal with matrices, okay, we have to think about, well, how can we measure the size of a matrix? Most, most matrix norms are defined uh, by using vector norms. There's the Frobenius norm is just an extension of the vector two norm to matrices. So it's just element wise squared sums. Um, and then well, we can look at the the demonstration for interpreting the norm of a matrix geometrically is that if you have a sphere, okay, the norm of a matrix is essentially the subspace that all that encloses all of the, the projections of unit vectors. And there's a nice, let me pull up the book now. That was kind of the main, like, those next two sections. Let me um, pull up this. Sorry, I, I didn't do a lot of notes, but. <laughs> um, so yeah, so this row pivoting, we have this matrix A, um, and you can see here, we have some zeros in the second uh, column of A. Okay, so when we, we have A this way, let me just also pull up this right now. I tried to use Pluto and I didn't get it to work very well. Um, okay, so A. A looks like this. Okay, we can kind of see that all of the diagonal of elements of A are non-zero. So when we do the LU factorization, we don't really have any issues. Um, however, if we run this code, we swap the second row and the fourth row. Okay. Now A has a zero right here. So when we do that LU factorization, we're gonna have a division by zero. Even though, um, 
And so, yeah, that's show here. So here we get these not a numbers because we have division by zero. Um, because of that LU factorization formulas that Andrew introduced, right, we're doing, we have the first row of U is equal to the first row of A. And then when we solve for L, we divide by U11. Uh, okay, and then this, this gives us this submatrix, right? So then we do the subtraction, and now we, we have this 0, 2, 0 here, right? So we need to, the next step would be divide by U22, two, two, which is a zero. It's going to be a 0. Okay. Um, but the LU factorizations, I mean, they're the same. Like A didn't, we just switched rows. It didn't really change. Okay. Um, so, yeah. So then they just introduced the algorithm here is a pseudocode. So essentially, it's the same code as before. Um, we just keep track now here, the argument max of the absolute value of the elements in the case column of the sub matrix AK. Okay. And then we just keep track of this ordering. So this is, uh, I think the the index, right? The argument max, I think will give us the, the index. Yeah, so here we're gonna rearrange the rows, um, but we're gonna save this so that we can, right? So we're gonna return the permutation so that we can know how to rearrange things to get back to um, our original AX equals B. Questions about this? I know my notes are not as good as <laughs> before, but yeah, so this is kind of the only thing that's really different. Um, let's see, I think this is the same number of flops. Okay. And then um, you can do this, these functions, yada, yada. Okay. Oh, yeah. And then this was the example of why we take the, the apps, the maximum. So if we have a matrix like this, um, our condition number for the um, LU factorization is a function of epsilon. Where was it? Right here. We have a condition number that's one over epsilon squared. Okay. So if you have really small epsilon, um, you have highly unstable LU factorization. Okay. So yeah, so this just says the section, yeah, is, like I said, it just is a trick to get around division by zero and LE factorization. Um, and then, yeah, the next section is on norms. So, yeah, so we have the, the two norm, which is the sum of the squares, the square root. So the square root of the inner product of a vector with itself. This is the standard norm that most people use. This is like a Euclidean distance. Um, and then you have the infinite norm and the the uh, one norm. Okay. And yeah, these are all the properties that a norm has to obey. So we have positive. Um, if a vector is zero, all zeros element wise, the norm has to be zero, has to scale with scalar multiplication and follow the triangular inequality. Okay. Um, and then the matrix norm, um, again, so this is the Frobenius norm. It's the same thing as the two norm for vectors, except now we have this matrix element wise square. Okay. So every element of the matrix is squared. We sum all the squares and we take the square root. Uh, and let's look at the, I don't know if I can, 
yeah, there we go. Sorry about that. Um, here is the geometric interpretation. So we have, um, where this is, is the geometric interpretation of the operator norm or the uh, matrix uh, induced norm. Yeah, the, a uh, different Fabinius. norm. Yeah, yeah. So on the this, uh, which one? This one, yeah. Yeah. So for a given norm with P, so if P is two, then we have, yeah. Uh, we define an induced matrix norm like this. So the P norm of A, uh, yeah, is the max of the vector X, the unit vector X with respect to the P norm. A times X. Okay. Um, so we have a unit circle. We have a matrix A. We project X onto the space of A. It looks like this. This is sort of the sub, the subspace of the sphere that A is going to project um, the unit, the unit vectors X, I believe. And this is for specifically for the two norm. This is kind of, yeah, measuring the size of, of A. Um, yeah. So I guess something new here is we have this sub subplot. I don't think we've seen that before. We're pushing. Is this a plot? No, this is like adding on to a plot, a subplot to. like a legend. <laughs> we have a non-integer increment that we can use. Our sequence. Um, this is, remember, the broadcast. So dot will broadcast, making it element-wise. So it's element-wise absolute value. Are there any questions or comments? I think these two sections were way more, like more straightforward than <laughs> the first five, Andrew. <laughs> yeah, I, I didn't know what the, um, uh, I, 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 I'm not sure what the level is, so I, I have to, I, I, yeah, I don't yeah, know how much no, I should I really enjoyed it. Yeah. <laughs> I really enjoyed your style. I wish I could put more time into <laughs> my part. <laughs> uh, don't worry. I I think the straightforward part here is that you have to deal with that zero diagonal problem, and mm -hmm. then this is an, a a good trick. And then the other yeah. one is more definitional, right? More definitional, yeah. which is mm -hmm. meant for two point eight. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we have, I guess, two more, three more sections. Yeah, two, two, two more. more. Yeah. Oh, two more. Yeah, sorry, two more. Yeah. And then this one has four. Um, let me see what we have next week. All right. No, nobody. <laughs> All right. Anyone? Hi, Lucio. 
Hi, everyone. I, I was only able to come today, sorry. No worries. Thanks for joining. Um, yeah. I, I can ping some of the other people and we'll see what happens. I don't know. <laughs> It's like yeah, I, I, I guess I, I guess I guess you could do uh I don't know, depending if depending on whether others could do the next two sections, uh I could probably wrap this up two point eight and two point nine, and then okay. someone should someone should do three, but uh, but yeah, uh, ping ping someone else first. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And then I'll yeah. if there's if there's no uh, then I could I could take two point eight and two point nine and then uh someone should do the next the intro probably to three, so that yeah um, yeah yeah sounds good yeah great did anyone else try to use that Pluto notebook no no I no. tried but I'm not sure if it works with the oh, don't forget to book. do the stop thing the package oh yeah. Thank you.